I command this mountain go. Be thou plucked up, removed, and placed into the sea. Oh, you mountain of crippling arthritis. Go! Impossible for him to walk. Listen, this is a mountain removed. Come on, Daddy. Come on. Glory, hallelujah. Glory, hallelujah. What do you think about it? Oh, it's wonderful. You're walking. Yes, I'm. What do you think about it? Oh, I, I don't know what to say. You're here. Yes. Amen. Amen. No more than. This man couldn't walk except these crutches. He had to walk on his foot. Amen. Amen. This is his mountain. This is the Voice of Revival television broadcast. This is your host, Chad McDonald. I'm delighted to come at you today on location, Miracle Valley, Arizona. I'm here at the site of Miracle Valley where the late, great General of the Faith, A.A. A. Allen, built Miracle Valley. We're here on location at his tombstone. We've got a powerful broadcast for you today. I'll be interviewing my very good friend, his son, Paul A. Allen, as we talk about what it was like to grow up in the Allen household, what it was like to be a part of the miracle-working power of God that was on display every day and every night under that gospel tent. I want to remind you that God is available for you right where you are in this very same anointing that was here on these grounds that operated under that tent is available to meet you at the point of your need through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's go into the interview. I know God's going to bless you. Today I'm with Paul Allen. Today we're gonna to talk a little bit about your father's ministry and really what God has done. So I wanna welcome you, um, Paul Allen, to the Voice of Revival. Well, I'm very glad to be here. I really am. And uh, I, I never grow tired of talking about yeah. my mom and dad and the ministry and what they did and what I'm doing now. Yeah, for those watching and listening that may not know, A.A. A. Allen was used powerfully in what's known as the Voice of Healing Era movement. Throughout the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, even into the 70s, God shook this nation through a revelation of his miracle healing and delivering power. And A.A. A. Allen was one of the generals of the faith that God used, one of the great pioneers in that movement and in his ministry throughout the 1950s and until 1970, when God called him into his eternal reward God used him powerfully. Every night, that tent was filled with thousands of people who would come in services three times a day, maybe sometimes more. And each night, they would come encounter, encounter the power of God in a supernatural way. Blinded eyes would see, deaf ears would come unstopped, wheelchairs would be emptied, hospital beds would be emptied out. So the power of God was displayed for thousands of people to see. They would come from all over the country to many of these locations around this nation, and God used him very powerfully. We're here right now in Miracle Valley, and we're going to take some time on this podcast talking about your father. And without further ado, let's get into the interview and talk to me a little bit about who your father, A.A. A. Allen, was. He, was. he was the greatest dad anybody ever had, as far as I'm concerned. I... People ask me all the time. Matter of fact, uh, I was talking to a lady on the telephone just a matter of five, ten minutes ago that I'd never met. And the one thing she asked me was, did you travel with your dad while he was on the road? And we did. We lived in a, most of the time, a 30-foot trailer house, parked it on the tent lot behind the tent. Uh, 
part of the time we'd have a 33 or 35 foot, but most of the time it was a 30 foot. And we traveled there. That was our home. And I thank God every day for what we grew up with and, and how we grew up and what we were taught and, and what we learned, not just by what they told us, but by what we could watch and see the way they lived. It was a, an incredible experience and I never ceased to be thankful for what we went through growing up. And my sister and I discussed this uh, just a few weeks ago where I spent the afternoon with her and we were talking about how fortunate we were to have the growing up experience that we had. And I thank him for it every day. Yeah. You know, what would you say that would that made your father different from the rank and file preacher of even today or of his day? What separated him? His dedication. He and my mother wrote a book called The Price of God's Miracle Working Power. Yeah. Um, I have that and it will be available where you can download it on the website within the next very few weeks. In answer to your question about what made him unique, yeah. is very early in his ministry, he was pastor in a church in Idaho at the time, or it might have been, it might have been Corpus Christi, Texas, and he and a couple friends went up to either Houston or Dallas and went to an Earl Roberts tent meeting. Yeah. And during that time that they were there, they were there for, I think, three to four days. But during the time that he was there going to Oral Roberts tent meetings, he experienced the kind of Shekinah glory that very few people ever see. Even people that are there in the tent don't see yeah. everything that, that God wants them to see. They're looking around and seeing what's going on and so forth. But his, when he came out of that meeting, he said, if God can use Oral Roberts to do that, he is going to use me to do the same thing. And he went back, got, went into what mom and dad always referred to as the prayer closet. Yeah. And he said, lock it from the outside and don't unlock it for anything or anybody until I knock on the door and say, let me out. And they both went to their grave, yeah. keeping that as a secret. But God gave him a list of about 13 things that he needed to take care of in his life. And when the final thing was, some of them were taken care of before he ever came out of the closet. Yeah. Others, it was a, a period of time. But when the last one of those things that he marked off the list had been resolved between him and the Lord, was when his true calling began to come into focus. And miracles uh, of all kinds, uh, casting out demons, uh, prophesying, everything that God had promised him that he would give him and the things that he told him would be part of his ministry. Yeah. At that point became part of what he was doing and everything fell into place. And the year that he died, Look Magazine had him listed in a list that they put in the magazine of the 10 most influential Yeah people, not the 10 most influential preachers in America, the 10 most influential people on earth. And he was one of those 10. And what he did 
first time we set up the tent was in Yakima, Washington. And black people, white people, Indian people, Mexicans, everybody came to the meeting and there was nobody even thought twice about the fact that they were all there together. Yeah. Then we went over to Boise, Idaho, had a meeting there, and it was the same way there. From there, we went to Tyler, Texas. That is considered deep south. Yeah. We found out down there that not only do people not want the different races to mix, there are written laws about it that if you do that, you can get yourself thrown in jail. Yeah. Serious type things. And the police came out and told mom and dad that you can't have these black people. They didn't call them that. Yeah. You can't have these people in this meeting with white people. If you do, we will arrest you and yeah. put you in jail. And he said, do it. If you do that, the one thing you're guaranteed is that you're going to give me a million dollars worth of free advertising and everybody in the United States will know who I am, that I'm in jail, and that I'm here because I had church. Yeah. And the Ku Klux Klan would come and try to burn it. They'd pour gas on it and set it on fire and it wouldn't burn. Come on. They'd take razors and knives and cut the tent, cut the ropes. The devil did everything yeah. within his power to try to stop daddy before he ever got a really yeah. good start. And we went from there to West Memphis, Arkansas, or West Memphis, I think that's in Arkansas, not Tennessee, if I remember yeah. right. And um, ran into the same problems down there. But daddy refused to obey the Jim Crow laws. Yeah. And what he did, plain and simple, he opened the door a crack to what ended up being the civil rights movement. Sure. And very quickly after that, Martin Luther King Jr. saw what was going on and said, if he can do that, I can, I can do what I want to do. Yeah. And people would ask Daddy, I've heard many, many, many people, more than I could ever count, Asked Daddy what he thought about what Martin Luther King Jr. was doing. And he would say, just bluntly, we're doing the same thing. Yeah. I'm doing it with love. He's doing it by getting in your face. But we're going to go to the same heaven. And if we can't worship together here, how are we going to do it in heaven? Yeah. And that was basically his philosophy and what he did and I talk about it in the book and in some other things that I've written in that what he and mother did they did not just change the southern part of the United States they didn't just change the United States yeah they and their ministry changed the world. Yeah, yeah, it did. Doing away with apartheid in South Africa would have never, ever happened without what Daddy had done in the United States. Yeah. And when you say, what did your dad do that's different? Everything he did was different. Mm -hmm. um, when we got to a, a big tent, Daddy went and held a revival at the fairgrounds in Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. One of the uh, pastors that was a sponsoring pastor came to Daddy and said, Brother Allen, I've got a young man in my church that is a wonderful, wonderful singer, and he's coming to every service, and I think that if you were to let him sing, you would enjoy it, and I think everybody here would enjoy it. So Daddy said, well, introduce me to him, and he did. And he said, would you sing it tomorrow afternoon's afternoon service? Yeah. He said, sure. So he came. And from then on, for the next few days, he sang in the afternoon service. And there wasn't a person in the, in the tent that wasn't tapping their toes and stomping their feet and clapping their hands and 
whole lot of them getting up and dancing up and down the aisles in the what everybody always called sawdust, but it's actually wood shavings. Yeah. And about halfway through the meeting, Daddy asked him if he'd come and sing in the night meeting. Yeah. And when we got ready to leave, Daddy hired him as his singer. Everyone, without exception, Every one of what were referred to back then as the big evangelists. Yeah. And I don't need to call their names. If you know who they are, you know. And if you don't, you wouldn't recognize the name anyway. But every single, without exception, every single one of the big evangelists, uh, which also included virtually all of the evangelists that were part of the Voice of Healing yeah. Association, called, wrote, notified daddy that if he hired Gene Martin that his ministry would end on the day he hired Gene Martin that he could not have him on the platform as part of the crew and get respect and have an audience that people would quit coming to his meetings yeah and he would listen to them and say, well, he appreciated their opinion and he was glad that they were willing to give him their opinion, but that he had talked to God about it and he was going to listen to God instead. That's the only one that matters. And he hired him. He worked for him till the day that he died. Yeah. Um, I've been to several of his meetings. I've taken part in some after Daddy died, uh, taken part in several of them. Um, taking a lot of pictures of him. I'm a photographer. Um, he was an incredible man. Yeah. But when you say, what did your dad do that was different? He was 100%, 110%, totally and fully dedicated to the ministry. Yes. Um, he had a life insurance policy that when he died, every single nickel of it went directly to the ministry, not to his family. Wow. He, what I, what I got was a million years worth of memories. And, um, uh, I would rather have that than $10 million. Yes. Yes. You know, you were talking about how your dad was a pioneer really in racial reconciliation in the nation. And a lot of people really only think about him as being a pioneer in the healing and the miracle movement, but he was very instrumental in bringing the races together, especially in the deep South, at the expense of much persecution that he had had to endure because he bucked those, those systems and, that, and those systems of those ungodly laws and said, I'm going to preach the gospel. And I believe that God's not a respecter of person. And so he was really a pioneer in that sense. He was the person that started the civil rights movement, period. I mean, he was one of the, he was the person that started it. And then Martin Luther King Jr., daddy opened the door a little bit. Yeah. Martin Luther Jr. kicked it wide open. Yeah. And from there on, um, it was what they did was changed the world. And people talk about how they changed, that person came to town and they changed the town. Yeah. Well, that, that's a big deal. Sure. They maybe moved to a state and changed the whole state. But there are very few people that you can look at what they did and say they changed the United yeah. States. And from there, what they did changed the world. You know, it's important because I'm reminded when you talk about that, I'm reminded of Acts 17, 6. And that scripture there tells us that the people of the town, when Paul came, they were so upset and they cried out and said, these that have turned the world upside down are come here also. Paul had a track record that everywhere he went, he turned the system of the enemy upside down. He shook cities with the power of the gospel. And that's the kind of anointing that your father walked in. When he came to many of these cities and, and counties and, and locations and put up that great gospel tent that's so beautifully displayed on that tomb, 
tombstone behind us that would seat thousands of people. It literally created a fervor in the community and people wanted to come out and experience it. You know, the Bible tells us that when they had heard of Jesus, his fame was spread throughout all of Syria. Well, when they had heard of the ministry of your father, faith began to come alive in so many people's hearts because he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ, like Paul said, not with the eloquency of the wisdom of men, but in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And he believed that God was the same today. Jesus Christ was the same today as, as he was yesterday, and it'll be the same tomorrow. And so people came from all over, all over the country. They would drive and, and pack these tents out, and they would come with an expectancy to encounter God. And they needed, desperately many of them, need a, needed a miracle. And there were so many miracles that happened under that tent. We're sitting in original chairs that sat under that tent. And you were so gracious to send our ministry one of those. And I often think when I pray alongside that, that chair, I'm reminded of the thickness and the richness of the anointing that was in that ministry under that tent. And that's available to us even right now. Let's talk a little bit about the miracles and the power of God that was displayed that you witnessed growing up under the tent so regularly. Well, it was not uncommon to pull up to the tent and around behind it, kind of off to the side a little bit and behind it, see anywhere from three or four to five or six or even 15 or 20 ambulances yeah. lined up in rows out there mm. where people that wanted to get healed and they couldn't go walk out and get in the car. They were bedridden, they were in the hospital and and they would hire an ambulance to literally bring them to church. And then the majority of the time, those ambulances went home empty. That's right. Glory to God. It, it, it wasn't something that happened once or twice and everybody was astonished. It happened every night. In, in my book, one of the questions I am always asked if I go to a church and speak and I do question and answer type things, and have somebody walk around with a wireless mic and I answer their questions. And one of the questions I always get asked, I, I don't think I've ever been to a church or an auditorium where we were doing it, where this was not a question that was asked. Yeah. They say, what's the most incredible miracle that you ever personally saw? And so when I wrote my book about growing up in the Allen home, I wrote one chapter, and the, the lead of the chapter is what was the most incredible miracle yeah. you ever saw. And I tell about three miracles in that. The first one is my brother John. He was two years older than I am. He's now gone on for his reward. But as a teenager, we all had jobs that we did in yeah. the tent, both as a setup crew and the breakdown crew, but also on a daily basis that we did on routine. I was a still photographer and I still am a still photographer. My brother John wanted to run a TV camera and he was on a scaffold on the back of the platform that was about 10 feet high. Wow. They rolled a stretcher. The lady had been brought there f directly from the hospital to the tent in an ambulance. Wow. And they had rigged up kind of a tent over her out of a bed sheet yeah. with sticks similar to kite sticks. If you are as old as I am, you know what that is. But they rigged this up where the sheets could not touch her body because 80% of all of her skin on her body had been burnt off. Mm. In that day and age, that was a death sentence. They had never even experimented at that time, I don't think, with growing that person's own skin in a yeah. Petri dish and putting it back on them. She had a death sentence mm. on her. Every doctor that saw her, she's going to die. They brought her up across the ramp. My dad turned to my brother and said, John, is 
zoom in on this real close. I want this on, on film so we can show it on TV. Come on. He didn't say, I think this lady may get healed. We're going to pray and we're going to say, God, if it be your will. Yeah. He prayed for her and said, be ye healed right now. Mm. And God healed her. Wow. John was up on the scaffolding filming it. He said that it was like watching a movie with special effects, but that in about a minute and a half to two minutes, all of the skin, before Daddy prayed, when you looked at her, what you saw was red, raw meat. Mm. You didn't see an old wrinkled arm from an old man. You just saw raw meat. Daddy prayed for her, and within two minutes, that skin just moving over her body, just like a fungus growing on a lake, only it was brand new, fresh baby skin. In the book where I t John talks about seeing that lady's skin grow back, the second one I talk about is when people ask Bob Chambach that same question. Yeah. He didn't talk about a miracle where he had prayed for somebody. He talked about a miracle that happened to a little boy mm. in Mobile, Alabama yes. that was healed of 23 things. Any one of the 23 was bad enough and serious enough to kill him. Yeah. God kept him alive till daddy got to town. He went to church and walked home. Mm. He was totally healed, 100%. And that's what Bob Schambach would tell about every single time. I pray that that message began to stir faith on the inside of your heart. And I believe that as you watched, something came alive on the inside of you. That's faith that had been laying dormant in many of your lives has been activated by the word of the Lord. And I believe that as you watch that message, the power of God's begin to come upon you right there in your home, right there in your car, wherever it is you've been watching this broadcast. Thank you for watching Voice of Revival with Chad McDonald. The Voice of Revival broadcast is a media ministry outreach of Revival Fire World Ministries and is made possible by the prayers and faithful support of partners like you. All gifts and contributions are tax deductible where allowed by law. For more information or to give, visit us on the web at www.thevoiceofrevival.com.